This is the story of the English Electric Canberra, the uh, aircraft with the longest history in the history of the Royal Air Force. Originally designed to replace the iconic de Havilland Mosquito from the Second World War. And first flew on 13th of May in 1949, so 71 years ago. And the last Canberra went out of RAF service in 2006, so it was a very long career indeed. So as I said, the requirement for the Canberra originates from the Second World War. The Mosquito had proven a bomber aircraft could rely only on speed and high altitude and dispense with guns to protect itself. With the arrival of the turbojet engine, the Air Ministry required a jet replacement of the Mosquito. Now, Chief Designer Petter designed an aircraft with very clean aerodynamics. But unlike the wooden Mosquito, it was a fully metal aircraft, with only a part of the tail fin made from wood. Its first flight in 1949 was performed by the again famous pilot of the Second World War, Roland Beamont, and went without a hitch. Um, the Air Ministry had already ordered 132 Canberras for bombing, photographic reconnaissance and training. But eventually, 900 were produced and it equipped a total of 35 RAF squadrons and was exported to more than 15 countries. It was its maximum speed of 540 miles per hour or 870 kilometers an hour service ceiling of 48,000 feet, almost 15 kilometers high, and the ability to carry a 3.6 ton payload, which made the Canberra an instant success. And until the arrival of supersonic jets at the end of the 1950s, Canberra was almost impossible to intercept. Its great range made it the first jet aircraft to make a non-stop transatlantic flight. In 1953, Canberra won the so-called last great air race from London to Christchurch in New Zealand, when it touched down after 23 hours and 51 minutes in the air. To this day, that record has never been broken. The Canberra beat several other records, such as the world altitude record, which in 1957 it set to an amazing 70,310 feet, which is more than 21 kilometers in the air. So not only did it replace the Mosquito, it even replaced the much bigger Avro Lincoln, which is basically a improved Avro, Avro Lancaster heavy bomber, um, until the arrival of the Vickers Valiant, the first of the V bombers. The Canberra proved to be most adaptable to such new miss missions, including a um, low level strike and ground attack role, for which it was armed, finally, with four Hispano 20mm machine cannons, as well as an array of rockets and bombs. It was later used for tactical nuclear strike. Now, this tactical nuclear strike is a little bit different than what the V-bombers did. Because V-bombers, they would drop nuclear weapons on, on strategic sites in the Soviet Union, while the Canberra would drop smaller nuclear weapons on the battlefield. But it was in its reconnaissance role that the Canberra proved to be indefatigable. Later variants featured stronger engines and a greater fuel capacity. It overflew the Soviet Union with impunity. It was so successful it was also used by the Americans. Even after better Soviet interceptors were adopted in the second half of the 1950s, the Canberra's high ceiling allowed it to fly along the East German border and have a peek over the border inside to examine the Warsaw Pact defenses. It was used in many of the conflicts worldwide and the ZRF was involved, all the way up to 2006, when its last operational mission was flown over Afghanistan. So, an incredible career. Now, the story goes that when the Canberra was taken out of service in 2006, the RAF also had to let go of its last carpenter. Now, what was his job? Well, to take care of that piece of wood in the forward portion of the Canberra's tail fin. So, the RAF employed a final carpenter just for the tail fin. Strangely enough, or even more strange, that was still not the end of the Canberra's career. The Americans had licensed produced the Canberra as the B-57, B um, and three of these aircraft are still today flying research missions for NASA. 
with an incredible career which in a way still continues anyway the video that you are watching now um is is the most interesting one because not only does it show the different canberras um but they are different models so you have the bomber reconnaissance versions and uh training versions but even there there's a lot of differences as well so here at raf cosmor for some reason they had assembled all these different varieties and if you look at the nose of the canberras you will see all these differences some of them have a blunted nose um some of them a more pointed nose and that pretty much gives an indication of what they were used for so a pointed nose would have carried a radar and um, was for training so it was for training not so much for canberra crews but uh, of um, weapons um, operators uh, radar operators of other aircraft like the, the, the gloucester javelin or the blackburn buccaneer so this white aircraft here with the number 850 is uh, is such a training version um, specifically for the blackburn buccaneer now this version has um, is, is slightly different again so uh, this one i think is a t11 um, which had originally a radar in it but later then it was removed and had other electronics and sensors in the nose also interesting is that the canberra had two underwing hard points um, for which it could uh, carry extra bombs rarely or actually never have nuclear bombs under them those they would all be in the internal bomb bay so this one is the pr3 so that is an early canberra uh, version the first reconnaissance version and that was later improved with the pr7 and pr9 now this hard point shows that this is a very specific version this is the tt the target tuck version again used for training of air defense so um, it would carry a or would tow a target tuck a sleeve um, hundreds of meters or even uh, a mile after behind the uh, the canberra so this is a later version the canberra pr7 so it was lengthened the fuselage was lengthened uh, which allowed more fuel and um, here you see the two windows which um, which house the cameras inside the canberra and also another difference was that the canberra pr7 got operated engines and that was of course necessary to carry the extra weight but also improved the performance now this very strange nose is of a canberra t17 so um not not just with radar but also had different sensors and all of that was for training all for electronic warfare uh, more specifically against uh, jamming so again here a similar nose uh, with the with the sensors so a lot of these canberras after they were used for bombing and then replaced by the v bombers were then adapted for these training roles and a lot of them continued their service all the way up to the 1980s but of course it is absolutely remarkable that one version the pr9 stayed in service until 2006 participated in all these conflicts in um, over libya and bosnia afghanistan um, an almost indestructible aircraft and it's uh, just a testimony that nasa in america